Good evening. I'm Carla Hills. I had the honor of serving as President Ford's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Living in Grand Rapids, a program hosted by the Grand Rapids Public Museum with the support of Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation Library and Museum to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the inauguration of Gerald R. Ford as our 38th president. President Ford was a man of great integrity who contributed enormously to our nation's well-being and was highly respected by both political parties. He served 25 years in the House of Representatives representing Michigan's 5th District and was elected minority leader in a democratically controlled Congress. Congress overwhelmingly approved him to become vice president when Spiro Agnew stepped down, accused of tax fraud, and again as president after Richard Nixon resigned amidst the Watergate scandal. President Ford's decisions were always guided by principles, not polls. His judgments were shaped by what he thought was just and right for our nation. His commitment to fair housing is just one of President Ford's many memorable achievements that made a lasting and positive change in our nation. His fight against racial discrimination started early for him. In 1934, he and his friend Willis Ward, an African American, were both stars on the Michigan football team. Michigan was scheduled to play Georgia Tech, which followed Jim Crow laws. Georgia Tech gave notice that it would not play if Michigan fielded a black player. Gerald Ford made it clear that he would not play if his teammate and his close friend, Willard Ward, was excluded. It was only after Willis insisted that he play that Michigan might beat Georgia Tech and he relented so Michigan won. His determination to fight racial discrimination stayed with him as president, and he made a real difference. As documented in the museum's historic look at redlining, Grand Rapids was just one of many cities that practiced redlining. Redlining denies government housing loans to persons living in black populated neighborhoods on the ground that such loans were unsafe, even though the applicant was personally qualified to receive the loan. Congress passed the Housing Act of 1968 with the support of Congressman Ford, which made redlining illegal. And the first bill that President Ford signed as president, the Housing and Community Development Act of 1975, took it one step further. It required federal housing funds to be distributed based upon poverty and housing overcrowding, prohibited discrimination, and established an enforcement mechanism at HUD. I know you will enjoy and learn from the museum's program, so let me say once again, welcome. All right, well, good evening, everyone. I am Brooke Clement, the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. Before we continue, can you please ensure that your cell phones are turned off or, on, or are, are on silent? <laughs> um, thanks. Tonight, I'd like to thank our partners at the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation and the Grand Rapids Public Museum, as well as you all for your continued support of the library and museum. There is a lot going on this week, and we hope to see you at Thursday's and Friday's big anniversary events. You may all know this, and as Carla Hills just said, President Ford and his, and his administration worked to vigorously enforce anti-redlining legislation, in addition to his work in Congress, ensuring passage of laws and regulations that would eliminate the practice. We are very happy to partner on this evening's program, given his legacy on this topic. And now, please join me in welcoming Dale Robertson, President and CEO of the Grand Rapids Public Museum. Hey. 
Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you being here today. I'm Dale Robertson with the Grand Rapids Public Museum, and uh, we are also pleased and privileged to be able to partner with us on uh, another installment of our GR Stories series. Uh, how appropriate that we're having this, this conversation today on an election day, because there is a direct tie back to the 14th Amendment of our Constitution, and, um, and how that amendment, national issues, right, played out locally. And that's the story that we'll be able to hear here today. You know, we have 250,000 artifacts and specimens by the most conservative count in our collections, 98% donated by the people of West Michigan over 171 years, and they're fabulous things. But it always comes down to the story. What is the story for each of those items? And so this is being filmed. You're all going to be in the archives, <laughs> permanently in the archives. But we call those artifacts and specimens primary sources. This is a primary source. This is being done today in first person. Let's call it first voice. And we'll call it full voice because it is the true story, right, that generations will be able to look back on and hear what it was actually like for these issues to play out here, how our hometown responded, and how we made it, well, really, I think as a few of us have talked, maybe something that went from tragedy to triumph. So what I'd like to do now is introduce a, a friend and a colleague uh, he's a Kent County Commissioner. He's a former chair of the board of the Grand Rapids Public Schools Board of Education. He's a sociology professor at Ferris State University, and actually GR Stories has been his sabbatical this year. And so to you know, put it together and then get the program moving, please let me introduce Dr. Tony Baker. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's so incredible to, to have this event here and to be thinking about um, these stories within uh, our history here in Grand Rapids. The emerging theme throughout this year has been history happens here. And it's really fascinating if you saw the panel outside and the uh, cover of the Grand Rapids Press from 19, spring of 1968. You see, when we think about historical events, we think about them happening when we study them by themselves. But on the front page of the Grand Rapids Press in the spring of 1968, there's a story about Gerald Ford supporting the Housing Act. But also on that page was a story about what was happening in the south of Vietnam, um, the story of RFK considering to get in the, uh, the primary election race, um, and the opening of celebrating the opening of Woodland Mall. But these are the stories that we end up interacting with. And the stories are made, um, in, from my experience, by many people that are in this room. Uh, I want to acknowledge a few collaborators. We've always saw that collaboration is important. Cl obviously, collaborating with the Ford Museum was something that you know I said to Dell a year ago, we got to do something that connects this. And this, to some extent, gave us the idea of the whole series, because I wanted to look at Ford's role in the series. Um, but we have, uh, I really want to highlight Circle Theater. Uh, Commissioner Lisa Knight, who is a board member for Circle Theater, is here in the house. Um, she is, it it's happens that the, the work of the world, that uh, A Raisin in the Sun is being produced by Circle Theater this month. And really, um, the story of Lorraine Hansberry's family and the play that was resulted after that um, ends up being a catalyst for this conversation tonight. That play begins, opens this Thursday and runs throughout August, August 8th to 10, 14th to the 18th, and 21st to the 24th at 7.30. Also, one of the first organizations I worked with when I came to Grand Rapids a couple decades ago, uh, Lee Weber was, uh, was on, this, on the uh, board of the organization, the Fair Housing Center of Grand Rapids, and Liz Keegan and Brianna Miranda are here as the education outreach team. They have materials there, and we're going to be discussing the history of it, but it is a way that Grand Rapids is responding to segregation um, today. Um, and also, I always, also want to point out uh, George Byard. Anytime we're talking about history as it relates to Grand Rapids, if you don't stop by George Byard's shop and talk to him, then you don't really know uh, what the story, where to start. Um, with that, I want to um, 
introduce Reverend Joe Jones, uh, who co-pastors Brown Hutchinson Ministries with his wife, Jesse. Um, he is also the president of the Hukima Group. Um, it, this is a really big job. These are big stories. When we talked about how do we tell this, the history of segregation in Grand Rapids and its response, um, these are the stories that came to the top because they seem to be unknown by, uh, by many people that live here. Uh, Joe's got a really big task to bridge these stories and connect them to our time here. But anyway, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Reverend Jones. Well, good evening. good evening. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be with all of you here on this evening um, and want to uh, especially recognize our our special guests who are sitting here on stage. And our time this evening, uh, as uh, uh, Tony has mentioned, is really about trying to weave together and really try to tell this story of uh, living in Grand Rapids. And uh, perhaps this will be new to some of you, uh, this story of Auburn Hills. Uh, but uh, for quite a few of you, perhaps it's something that you're very familiar with. And it's, I think, a, just a, a reminder of you know what uh, what we were as a city, and uh, hopefully it will give you a sense of what we can be, uh, because uh, when it comes to history, I think the, the goal is always to learn from it, and, and of course not to repeat it, especially if it was not good history. And so on this evening, uh, we are going to hear from some folks who were, they were there, they were right there uh, when this was happening, and uh, some who uh, were connected to individuals who were there as well. And so looking forward to our time on this evening. And I wanna begin by really giving uh, each individual an opportunity to tell you about themselves. Uh, but before I do that, how many of you are familiar with Auburn Hills? They were, yeah. Um, so you, you, you we're talking about this, what I would describe as a, it's, it's an enclave on the northeast side of Grand Rapids, right? 20 acres. And we're talking about a, uh, a piece of, of property, a piece of land that was uh, that was made available uh, to uh, the development community uh, in the 60s, and there were four gentlemen. I like to refer to them lovingly, um, Beverly, as the big four, uh, because you had to be um, a giant to engage in the work of trying to uh, buy property um, in Grand Rapids in the early 1960s with the plans of developing it into a community uh, that would consist of people who look like you. And so these were four African-American men. Uh, first was Samuel Triplett, uh, who was a teacher and the first African-American to teach in the Grand Rapids Public Schools at South High. There was also Mr. Joseph Lee. He was a social worker. He was also a leader uh, with the Grand Rapids Urban League. Uh, there was J.E. Adams, who was an educator, serving as a teacher, administrator, and principal. And then there was Dr. Julius Franks, who was a dentist. He was president of the West Michigan Dental Society and All-American football player at the University of Michigan. Now, what these four had in common were that they all were uh, members of Tawasi, which was an organization that was created to provide funding for high school students uh, to, to go further, to go beyond high school, to, to, to provide scholarships for high school students in Grand Rapids. And so these four uh, gentlemen had come together and made the decision that they were going to uh, purchase this 20 acres of land and to, and to develop it. Um, and the idea was to create an attractive subdivision of 50 or 60 medium priced homes owned by the city of Grand Rapids. Well, um, it's fair to say that the vast majority of folks, the neighbors, uh, didn't want to have anything to do with that. They were very vocal in their opposition. They fought the development aggressively. And uh, their thoughts, their words were, they were worried that the area would become a slum and devalue surrounding neighborhoods. So uh, in steps the city, city of Grand Rapids, uh, city hall, and the city fought the sale, uh, claiming the land had been dedicated in the master plan as park space. There was a battle that ensued that was fought in newspapers. It was fought in public hearings. It took over two years to be settled, but eventually the developers prevailed and constructed their first house in 1964. Now, the initial bid that the big four uh, submitted 
was $20,500. This, this was the bid for the property, and they, they were told it was too low. Um, I don't know about you, but um, if, I am, if I have my, 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 my hopes set on something and I'm coming with everything that I got and I'm told that, I, that it's just not enough, uh, some of us might just say, you know what, forget about it. Well, that was not the case for these four gentlemen. Uh, they came back with a bid of $60,000. After the city, after the city somewhat arbitrarily uh, set the minimum bid at fifty-four thousand, so the city said, "Okay, twenty thousand uh, is not enough, so we're just going to throw a number out there, fifty-four thousand. And these four gentlemen came back with a bid of sixty thousand dollars, with five-year payoff terms. And so, eventually, the city commission approved the sale, and after a lawsuit by neighbors was dismissed, the city passed, or the, the city allowed for this to occur, and you had the creation of Auburn Hills. And so, as I mentioned in my opening, there were individuals who were actually there who uh, have uh, some, some, what I would say, some rather intimate details of what it was like to grow up in Auburn Hills or grow up in Grand Rapids at that time. And I wanna start things out uh, by asking uh, two sisters. Uh, we have, to my right, far right, we have uh, Beverly Grant, uh, as well as Cheryl Franks, and these two uh, ladies uh, were there. These are the daughters of, of Dr. Franks. And uh, I will tell you, uh, just to, to, to make it known, how many of you all had the opportunity to know Dr. Franks? Anybody here? Yeah. I mean, there, there's the, the reality. He was a giant of a man in terms of size, but he really was a giant of a man. And so I am honored uh, to actually be on stage with uh, the two daughters of such a giant and would love to hear from you two, if you could, just share with us what it was like to grow up uh, in Auburn Hills or grow up in Grand Rapids around that time. <laughs> Do we do point, point, finger pointing? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us and thank you for everyone that showed up. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am the oldest of uh, I'm the second oldest of five that are still here. We're four of us are still all around. So a lot of the stories that we have are going to be quite um, removed because we had already lived on the northeast side of town at the time when my father, Dr. and Mr. Triplett and Mr. Lee and Mr. Adams were thinking about this property. Now, you have to remember that I can say that I have dementia now, because I probably had dementia then, being five years old and not knowing what was going on <laughs> in my household. Um, but I remember that when I went to school and my father came home and was talking about some property and some land, and by the way, he used to take us every weekend to look at property and houses. We just drove in a car, in a car, in a car, and we looked at houses, and we did start playing a game, like, I want that one, I want that one. Of course, we tried to get the biggest one, but we had heard that he, he was doing meetings, and sometimes they were at our house. So we were hearing, but at five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, we weren't sure really what was going on. So I knew that we, when I was in school, and I was the first one to go to Ken Hills, I think I was one of the first black kids that were there, that people started talking about me and talking about things, but I think it was because their parents knew about what was gonna possibly be happening over in Auburn Hills. So I started getting picked on quite a bit. Um, I will say that I won most of my fights. <laughs> So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, I, I made it through, and I knew that when they were talking about this, people started shunning us as children. Now, we were the only black family on our street, and we are only th three blocks from the Auburn Hills development. So we would go over there quite frequently, and we knew a lot of the families that were there we got to play whenever we could. Most of the time, African-American children, black children couldn't go out and play a whole lot. And definitely in other people's neighborhoods, it was taboo because you couldn't walk over there, you couldn't stay over there, you couldn't be out after dark. Um, I remember I couldn't even go to Briggs Swimming Pool and I knew how to swim as a baby. Just throw me in the water and away I went. But we couldn't go. So when we would go over there, we saw all of this land that was being developed and we didn't know what was happening and why people were fighting us and why people were talking about us. Well, it's because 
My father one day sat us down and said that he wanted us to grow up and have the same opportunities as our fellow children, other families in the neighborhood, and the same opportunities, and that all of the stigma that had been placed on our family from having previously lived, or I did anyway, on the southeast side of town was that we had been pigeonholed, and that was all we were worth, and we shouldn't be able to have anything more, and we shouldn't be able to go anywhere more. But he said that wasn't right that we live in a free country and we should be able to have the same rights and responsibilities and same privileges as others. So once they developed the land and people started buying houses after the big battle that was described, it became an unbelievable neighborhood. I will say that it was all the houses with the exception of one was bought moved into and occupied by African Americans. Now there's a white house there, literally a white house, where the only people that have ever lived in that house are white. Mm. And they were the first white family that moved over there. And I knew them very well, but they built this neighborhood that was absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful front yards, children that played in the streets, not a lot of loud noises. They had parties on the lots that were empty. There's still some that are bought by individuals, but they don't have built anything on them. They would get together as neighbors and watch out for each other and discipline each other's children. It was like you were living in utopia mm. back in the 60s. That's how beautiful it was. Now the properties kept developing and they finally sold every one of the lots. And to this day, I'm very proud to say that we still have property over there and it still looks very nice. It has changed, it has turned over, the population has turned over. It's a mixed neighborhood now, but people still try to get along and the neighbors could not come back and say anything to City Hall, to the courthouse, about how giving us money to live there ruined their ability to survive in the outskirts of the Auburn Hills neighborhood. Thank you very much for that, You're Cheryl. Welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Ditto? <laughs> <laughs> So my experience, um, I'm Beverly Franks Grant, and one of the daughters of Julius Franks. And Cheryl's um, description of what happened during that time is, is very accurate, so I won't repeat that. Uh, I will say that those times that we had to go on those Sunday drives, which were frequent, 25 years later, 30 years later, now I understand why. I know more about two by fours. <laughs> I know more about layouts of houses. I know more about land, to, so much to the point that the, the house that my husband and I just purchased, it had to have three things. It had to have uh, sidewalks, street lights, and safe. And I live, every house that we have purchased, those were the three things that I had to have because of the things that he instilled in us during that time, which, you know, when your parents tell you something, like, oh, whatever, I'm never going <laughs> to use that, I don't know. Um, but it turns out it has been very helpful as we have gotten older. I also want to mention that we do have some folks in the audience who literally lived in Auburn Hills, and that's Diane Spencer. I forgot your, your name. So she's sitting right over there yeah. and can contest to the fact that during winter or Christmas time, everybody in the land, we called it the land, mm -hmm. everybody on the land would have um, paper bags with candles in it lit all over all of those houses, all down the street, all of the time. Um, and so it was, it was a community in and of itself that held its own for a very, very long time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
As we know, the, the, the year again was uh, 1964 is when that first house uh, was moved into. And it was in 1964 that there was a gentleman who was representing Grand Rapids uh, in the U.S. Congress, and that was Gerald Ford. And uh, we have with us Richard Norton Smith, who is an award-winning author and presidential historian. And I'd like to give uh, Richard an opportunity to speak to uh, really the, the influence and the support for civil rights and fair housing uh, that was provided by Gerald Ford. And I have, I have a quote that I want to share and would ask that you would expound on this, um, Richard. And that is, you said at one time, you said that... Um, you said Ford got into politics. I like to say for the right reason, he was an insurgent. And when, I, when we consider the word insurgent, an insurgent is someone as a rebel or a revolutionary standing up for the people. And so again, it's 1964. We have this development that's going in the northeast side of Grand Rapids, first of its kind. Uh, people are wondering, what, is, what does this mean for our, for our city, for our community? And all the while, there's Gerald Ford, who, who knows this city, who knows this community, and he rep he's representing Grand Rapids in Congress. Uh, well, thanks. Um, and let me just say, really, what an honor it is to share this, uh, this platform. Um, he was an insurgent. You know, he got into politics, as I say, for the right reason, not just because he was ambitious, although he was ambitious, but because of an idea. Um, he had been an isolationist before World War II. In fact, he had been one of the co-founders of America First at Yale, which, by the way, meant something very different from what the term means today. Um, but he went off to the war, and he came back, um, like Arthur Vandenberg, mm -hmm. his hero, uh, with a completely different way of looking at the world. And um, he took on the political machine. A lot of people... I don't think are old enough to remember Frank McKay, but the fact is that uh, there was a, a Republican corrupt political machine that dominated this city and the state for a, quite a while. Uh, and his name is on that building, uh, not so far from here. In any event, Ford took him on and in 1948 ran for Congress against a, an entrenched, uh, Dutch, <laughs> um, distinctly right of center, isolationist congressman named Bartel Jonkman, and everyone thought he was crazy, and he beat him in the primary. Uh, and it was on the issue of internationalism, support for the Marshall Plan. But also, it turned out, Ford was a liberal, certainly by Republican standards. He had the endorsement of the United Auto Workers, which is something rather unusual for a Republican in these parts. And he very quickly established himself as, among other things, a supporter of civil rights. Not only did he publicly uh, and frequently endorse uh, the, the landmark Brown v. Topeka school board case in 1954, but he did something rather remarkable. Um, he voted for an amendment introduced by the only African-American congressman, Adam Clayton Powell, who represented Harlem at the time, who after the Brown case came down, and of course there was massive resistance in the South, basically uh, Powell introduced um, an amendment that would escrow any federal education money for any school district that resisted the court. And uh, that's a fairly radical concept in 1956 and 57. And Ford voted for it, just as he voted for the Civil Rights Bill in 64, he voted for the Voting Rights Act in 65, and he has, in the end, he voted for the Fair Housing Act in 68. Where did he come by those views? Um, he's very much a product of Grand Rapids. The best speech he ever gave was the day after the 4th of July in the bicentennial year of 1976. On the 5th of July, he got on a helicopter and flew down to Monticello to preside over a, a naturalization ceremony. And he talked about black is beautiful. And he said, you know, the more we thought about it, the more we realized, of course, black is beautiful. 
But he said, but, but you know, thinking about it, still more, so are white and brown and red and yellow. And he told the story of his Grand Rapids Sunday school teacher who had related the famous, the biblical story of Joseph and his many colored coat. And to Ford, that was a metaphor for the way America was supposed to be. He grew up in a household that was very clearly, on, well, one of his best friends uh, as a boy lived on Union Street. Um, a kid named, uh, I don't want to screw up his name. Uh, he, he was a son of an African-American coachman. And he was a frequent visitor in the house. Uh, they used to slay down Union Street uh, in the winter, and they would walk together to school. And he was, of course, as everyone knows, a local football hero before he was uh, a Michigan football hero. And years later, the one African-American player, well, why did he go to South High? He could have gone to Central, which was the place kids who knew they wanted to go to college in those days were funneled. And a teacher talked to his parents and said he should go to South High. Mm. He'll, re he'll meet a wider range of people. And he'll, be, uh, he'll have a, a, a better grasp of the world. And he did, and he did. And it wasn't all Dutch. And there were Italians, and there were Syrians, mm. and yes, there were African Americans. And, and one of them was a kid named Silas McGee who played on the football team that won the state championship. And years later, Silas McGee told Steve Ford, the president's youngest son, um, he was trying to explain the relationship that they had. And he said, Gerald Ford was colorblind. And he said, he was my brother. And well, you heard the story from Secretary Hills about Willis Ward with whom Ford roomed when they were on the road. And there's a story by a story, then I'll shut up. But I, the story, so much as people don't know, or they make assumptions. Um, the football team at the University of Michigan, they'd recruited Willis Ward, who was gonna go to Dartmouth. He was all practically signed. And Harry Kipke, who was the football coach, at the last minute, promised Willis Ward that his playing time on the field would be determined by his ability and not, he would not be, in other words, held back. The legendary Fielding Yost, the forever athletic director, had never in 40 years fielded a black player. Well, Fielding Yost happened to be the son of a Confederate infantryman. And they may have had something to do with that. In any event, Willis Ward agreed to join the Michigan team. When they were on the road, customarily, uh, African-American players did not stay at the same hotel as the rest, with the rest of the team. And Ford thought that was unjust. And more important, Harry Kipke not only thought it was unjust, he, at the Palmer House in Chicago, went to the management in front of the public and said, um, if he doesn't stay here, then none of us are staying here. And I will go and tell all the other coaches I know that you discriminate, and I will make sure that they don't come to the Palmer House either. And guess what? The hotel backed down. A maid told Willis Ward that he was the only the second African-American who had ever been at the Palmer House. The other was Marian Anderson, mm. the, the singer. So anyway, the combination of family, scouting, you know, Gerald Ford is still the only Eagle Scout um, to be president. Uh, the church, which was a significant impact. Um, you know, and his own basic decency, um, and, and just to jump to the 1968 
That was the, the toughest of the three civil rights bills to vote for politically. Mm -hmm. Ford said in the last week before the vote, he said he got 30,000 pieces of mail. He said it was by far the largest um, that he had ever gotten, and he'd been in the House for 20 years at that point. Now, just so I'm not making him out to be, uh, you know, an absolute hero here, you have two Gerald Fords. It's like a man riding two horses. He arrived an insurgent, mm -hmm. a liberal Republican, mm -hmm. if you will, but he wanted to be Speaker of the House, which meant becoming leader of his party, which meant being leader of a party that was increasingly conservative. So he's riding two horses. And so if you go back and look at the legislative history, you will find that throughout the preliminary skirmishing over the bill, there are Republican alternatives that Ford is pushing as the Republican leader. Um, but on the final vote, the determining vote, he voted for the, the law that was in fact passed. And I believe he was in a minority in his party who did so. Um, so there's, in effect, there's kind of the, the political Gerald Ford mm -hmm. who wanted to be Speaker of the House. And then there was the uh, Grand Rapids Gerald Ford. Mm. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone repeat after me and say 1978? 1978. 1978. 1978. That was, for some of us, that was a good year. Right? Some of us weren't even here, perhaps, in 1978 on Earth because uh, we weren't born yet. But 1978 is when uh, Doreth Ardoin became a realtor. 1978 is when Doreth Ardoin stepped out into, uh, stepped out on faith, so to speak, and stepped into a space and a place that just was not the norm for African Americans. And we have with us on today Doreth Ardoin, who is still today a real estate agent, but she's much more than that. And I'd love to, uh, if we could, take an opportunity to hear from Doretha about her time as a, her start in real estate. But again, because again, we're talking about, you know, the, 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 the 1960s of the creation of Auburn Hills, this new development, these uh, home ownership opportunities. And if, you, if, if we think about that on today, uh, 2024, um, and we think about the real estate market and the fact that there just isn't a whole lot of uh, properties that are available. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm fa I, it, it, what fascinated me was learning about what was available back in 1978 and what that was like. But also, uh, along with uh, Doretha, uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Lee Nelson Weber, who is going to, and they're both going to be talking about uh, the Fair Housing Center, which again played has played a critical role in what it means to live in Grand Rapids. But Doretha, Doretha Ardoin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 1978. Yeah. I could say I started when I was 12, but you probably <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you I had black hair. <laughs> uh, for me, that experience was uh, very interesting. I moved here from a little small town called South Haven, Michigan in 1977, and I worked for a store that you might remember called Kmart. <laughs> and I was a first, even then. I was a sporting goods manager and an African-American female sporting goods manager, probably the first in West Michigan at Kmart. So there's been many firsts for me. When I when I was asked to transfer to Jackson, Michigan, and I sold sporting goods, I thought about I thought about guns, and I thought about prison. Hmm. And I thought, I don't want to move to Jackson, Michigan, so I quit. I answered an ad in the newspaper, a print ad for a career in real estate. And uh, everybody, including my family, including the few people that I knew, discouraged me from doing that. They said, you will not survive. There is no such thing as black real estate agents in the city of Grand Rapids. And you'll be chewed up and spit out. 
And so the more I heard that I couldn't and that I shouldn't, and me being the fourth uh, oldest daughter of six children, kind of the middle child, you would say, I'm the stubborn one. So the more I heard that, the more I was determined to do it. So I went forward, got my license, passed my exam, started practicing. I never really noticed that there weren't very many people that looked like me in my industry until I started showing up to all the events and meetings and realizing I was one of the few first African Americans in the whole history of the Grand Rapids Association of Realtors, which is now 132 years old. Um, so I say that only to say that when I started, I experienced discrimination personally as a realtor, not only as a person of color or as an individual seeking housing, but trying to help others seek housing. I was uh, experiencing ex discrimination because folks assumed that because I was black and a realtor that I was going to move black folks into their neighborhood. So I was met with a ton of rejection, just made me stronger. And um, I'm just very proud to say that for 45 years, I still exist. I'm still making a difference. I can say that I'm uh, still fighting and still experience some discrimination, and so a, a lot of the public. Uh, I decided early on in my career to, um, I, I found that so many folks were being discriminated against, and I was personally. Uh, I found out about the Fair Housing Center of West Michigan. It was just called the Fair Housing Center then. And I joined, uh, kind of, it was kind of controversy for a realtor to be on the board with the Fair Housing Center because they were after folks that were discriminating and doing wrong, which were mostly realtors practicing incorrectly. Um, but I took it upon myself to become an advocate and, and ended up, I would say, joining, making uh, the Real Estate Association now partners with the Fair Housing Center to further fair housing. Um, that's how I know Lee Webb. Lee was uh, the executive director at the time and um, the staff now. So I can share other experiences, but I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. So to my immediate right is Lee Nelson Weber, and uh, I will tell you, I moved in, to Grand Rapids in 1996, and Lee Nelson Weber has been synonymous with the Fair Housing Center. Um, and I think it speaks volumes because when we think about the Fair Housing Center, um, the Fair Housing Center started off of a $1,500 seed money that came from the Dyer Eyes Foundation, 1,500 bucks. The Fair Housing Center of Greater Grand Rapids was incorporated on September 4th, 1980, and it was to support and encourage equal opportunities in the Greater Grand Rapids area. So, Lee Nelson Weber, you, you remember those days. <laughs> I do remember yeah. those days. Um, you took me back a little bit further. In, when you say 1978, I was the executive director at the East Town Community Association, another high-level job uh, in, my, in my career. And my husband and I that year bought our five-bedroom brick house in East Grand Rapids for um, the sum of $30,000. So when, when you think about that, it's almost like wagon train days, I think. <laughs> No, that's right. Wow. How far back that goes. <laughs> so, um, so I, so I, I was working at East Town Community Association, and I think of that. Um, if you think of the early days of the Fair Housing Center, uh, I, I think that um, neighborhood associations were a particular driver there because we were all realizing uh, the segregated housing patterns that went on in East Town. Uh, they, they really were all over, particularly the southeast side. The northeast side, as, um, as Cheryl and, and Bev said, 
uh, you know, very few, very few black families on the northeast side, uh, certainly on the west side, but the southeast side still was, was where uh, black families lived, but it was also quite segregated. And so in East Town, where I lived, it was certainly segregated. So there were several neighborhood associations that were involved in that, which is how I think I got into, uh, into the whole matter of fair housing. There were two other things also going on. Uh, at the time, the Board of Ed was certainly concerned with housing segregation because with, with schools being geographically organized, uh, the schools were segregated. And so this was a problem. Uh, we were, you know, we were years after Brown versus the Board of Education and schools were still segregated. So they were in it. Uh, in fact, the first office for the Fair Housing Center, which I did not work in at the time, was with the um, with the Board of Ed on Bostwick, which is which we now think of as the community college campus. And then um, and the other thing that was going on at the time, and I think really a driving factor, was a what I would call confidential housing testing project that went on uh, with the sponsorship of the Realty Association. And it was done by the Calvin College Research Center, Social Research Center. It uncovered um, what I would call significant housing discrimination, particularly in the rental market, also in the housing sales market. But the, um, the controversial part of it from my end was that the results were promised not to be used for enforcement. They were only used for education purposes. And so there was a bit of a, um, a bit of a uh, impatience with that, I would say, from the people who were, uh, who were bent on enforcing the fair housing law and not, not just educating. And so when Doretha talks about um, those early years at the Board of Realtors, I, I think that that um, that you were really a bridge. You know, there there was not good feeling uh, between the realtors and the fair housing advocates, and I think to bridge that really did bring us together, got us into further um, further work with housing testing, and and really uh, brought the fair housing center into its own. There were two other things that were important. One is. Um, one is a, a tiny little phrase in the Community Development Block Grant of 19, I believe, 1976. And it says that cities who receive Community Development Block Grant funds will affirmatively further fair housing. And I'll tell you, we took those, that tiny little phrase out of a very large federal act, and we raised money with it because we went to everybody who was receiving community development money, which at the time was Kent County, it was the city of Grand Rapids, it was the city of Wyoming, and we said, what about supporting the Fair Housing Center? And so that, that really was a part of a financial basis, along with $1,500 from the Diary Ribes Foundation. The other thing that was very important to us, I would say, and to our early growth, uh, was a very close partnership with the Fair Housing Center of Metro Detroit. These people, by 1980, they, they were already experts in enforcing fair housing law, I would say. So two people who were there, Cliff Shrupp, who was the executive director at the Fair Housing Center, and the testing coordinator, uh, Marvin Thomas, those two people were really instrumental in moving us along, uh, particularly in terms of training. I mean, we just did not know the law. We didn't know how to do testing. Uh, we, we had good hearts and good intentions, but we didn't know things. They, um, they taught us an awful lot. And they also, uh, as the National Fair Housing Center, or the National Fair Housing Alliance was forming up in later years, I would say probably late 80s, maybe 1990, they kind of carried us along as a founding member of that National Fair Housing Alliance. But really, I do not think that, that we would have been so successful uh, or even have a fair housing center around at this point had we not had that really huge lift 
from the people in Detroit. So we really, we learned a lot, and I think that we brought it here really to the benefit of, um, of people in Grand Rapids. I mean, there, there is kind of a, there would be a perception that Detroit is a very segregated city. But I think to come to Grand Rapids and hear what people really have experienced in the housing market, it is just as segregated here for, for families who are looking for a home. Thanks so much for that, Lee. Thank you. So we, we, we've heard these stories. We've, we, we've gotten, a, I think, a pretty good idea of, of what Grand Rapids was like. Um, again, some of us in the room here perhaps have dug a little deeper into the history of our, of our beloved community. And here we are now in, in, the, uh, in the 21st century, 2024, um, in a time in which our city is recognized as obviously the second largest city in the state. Um, and here we are nestled in between the Detroit and the Chicago. Um, and some would say that we are, uh, there's a certain uniqueness to Grand Rapids. Um, I would tend to agree. I say that because not every city can tout the fact that they have, you know, that, that, that it, was, it, was, it was there that a future president of the United States was born, right, so, or, or was raised. And so we have the, the, you know, the, the uniqueness of being able to say that you know, Gerald Ford came from the 616. And we have the uniqueness, uh, perhaps, of saying that we, we have, as part of the annals of history, these, the story of Auburn Hills. And here we are now in 2024, and I want to suggest, just based on uh, being someone who, who loves my city, who studied my city, this is a place that people want to live. Um, in, in particular, I want to say Grand Rapids proper. Uh, and we, we, we see that based on the fact that there just isn't a whole lot of housing units that are available. And so when we think about, you know, what is it that makes Grand Rapids unique or why would people want to, to live here? I'd love to hear from you all in terms of, you know, you, you can look back now. Again, you, you've had lived experiences. You were there when... Again, things were very, very different. Some of you might say, well, things are not that different. But would love to hear from, from, uh, from, from you all in terms of what do you think uh, makes Grand Rapids unique and what is your vision for Grand Rapids as it pertains to what it means to live in Grand Rapids? What's your vision for that? Can you ask an easier question? Uh -huh. <laughs> You know, it's interesting that you say, what was our vision? Um, we're young, uh, as, as everybody here. So when all of this was happening back in the day, a lot of us were five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. And now that we've lived through it, it's kind of our lives. And we have accepted it, and we enjoy it, and we've stayed. I know I've gone away for 20 years, and this was always my goal to return here and to live. Mm. I think a vision for Grand Rapids would be that if Grand Rapidians genuinely stood up to those who live in the Michigan, Grand Rapids, Greater Grand Rapids, the surrounding areas, and said to each other, we need to be a people of companionship. We need to get along with each other. We need to provide and open doors for each other. We need to show each other that it is okay to be who we are, whatever color, whatever background you came from. I mean, I, I can vividly remember the words that were spewed at me, the negative words, and it was, what did I ever do? Why didn't you like me? <laughs> I, I don't ever remember being able to go back in my mind then and saying, gee, I hit this person, or I said something mean, or I ran over something. But today when I see people, and there's still some of the people that I went either to school with or I see in the community, they still look at me funny. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't feel good. So if people who live here could really look deep and say to themselves, what can I do to be a friend to you? What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you get your house or to prevent somebody from getting your house? Mm -hmm. It would be just a 
it's a great place to live. It would just be one step higher. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Well, she's the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much anymore. <laughs> and that's come over time because we were raised to give back. We were raised to help people. And yes, we need to do all of those things. But it does get down to policies. It does get down to practices, financial practices, business practices, educational practices, all of the, those above. That until we get closer, and unfortunately, this is from the Book of Beverly, <laughs> it ain't happening right now. It has become the haves and the have-nots, and those in the middle are getting squeezed out. Who's in the middle? When it comes to housing, we know what it looks like out there right now. To rent? Really? The cost of renting, the cost of housing is just outrageous. So Cheryl and I both still have rental property. And my husband would say, well, you know, okay, that's your missionary work. <laughs> because I would never be at market rate, mm -hmm. never. Even to this day, I'm not at market rate, it kills me. I've lost because I'm not at market rate, but I gained one or two families that th their kids went to City High. Those kids graduated, those kids are going to college, and there's no way on paper I should have ever Rent it to them. They didn't qualify. Not at all. I'm like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing here. But it was something that God did to just get, let them have a chance. Had them in a duplex. They kept having kids. I'm like, Lord Jesus, this is not. <laughs> I mean, you can be Catholic, but Jesus, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm that one. <laughs> But, yep. and, and they, but they all did so well. People need opportunities to succeed. They need to have experiences where they've succeeded. And it's getting rougher and rougher and rougher right now for families to just make ends meet, much less have experiences outside the house, outside the neighborhood, all of those things. And I have to go back to Auburn Hills, mm -hmm. And I was able to build my first house on that land, and it was a community. And when I say community, I'm, I, my mother called me at 9 o'clock at night and said, what are you doing outside cutting the grass? I'm like, how do you know I'm outside cutting the grass? <laughs> well, that would be Mr. Spencer. <laughs> that, would, that would be Mr. Jackson. That would be Uncle, Uncle um, or Mr. Adams. They all watched out for us. And we're concerned, but we don't have, you don't even know your neighbors half the time right now. It's all part of housing. It's all part of a community. It's all part of staying together or sticking together. But let's go forth and flourish. Good luck. I'm getting better. <laughs> yeah, <you're> getting better. <laughs> Well, I, I, I come at this as, I guess, something of an outsider. Um, I came to Grand Rapids in 1995. Uh, I was director of this museum for six years, and then went away and uh, wrote a book about Nelson Rockefeller, and then came back and wrote a book about Gerald Ford, and decided I'm here for the duration. Uh, but the Grand Rapids of 1995 it looks very different and feels very different from the Grand Rapids of 2024. In some ways, we've grown up. In some ways, we've grown apart. Um, in some ways, we are victims of our own success. I mean, I was an urban pioneer. Literally, I was astonished. 30 years ago, I lived up on Fulton Street, up on the hill. And I rented, and I was astonished to run into people who had never been in downtown Grand Rapids. Did, were afraid of going to downtown Grand Rapids. I mean, I don't know what they had been fed, I suspect, 
We can all suspect what they've been fed. That has been transformed. That attitude, I think, I, I, I boil it down culturally. If you want to know how Grand Rapids has changed, um, the arena. Hmm. When the arena was built, if you had announced in 1995 that Elton John was coming to town <laughs> to do a concert, there would have been pickets uh, protesting his visit. Today, you'd sell it out you know, in five minutes. Um, that's but of the surface. And, and, and these people know much more than I do about beneath the surface and the underlying problems. And let's, let's face it, in addition to long-standing prejudices that exist, we have a modern media that find it profitable to exploit the divisions latent and real. What I call unsocial media, um, I get asked once in a while, you know, if you could make one change in our democracy, you know, what would you do? And I once made the mistake of honestly saying I'd pull the plug on the internet <laughs> if I could if I could undo the internet somehow. The irony is this instrument of communication that was supposed to bring us together and to foster some great global conversation has in fact there's some of that, don't get me wrong, atomized and polarized further the culture. And, and you're, you're battling, you see it in our politics, uh, and I'm sure you see it in everyday life. So on the one hand, Grand Rapids physically, is, it's, it's, I mean, downtown is gorgeous. I mean, if you like soccer stadiums and amphitheaters, um, this is your place. I don't quite get the beer city business, but you know, I, you know, whatever the Chamber of Commerce wants to wants to sell, that's fine. But beneath all of that glittering exterior, uh, my hunch is human nature hasn't changed all that much, and it's still an uphill struggle mm -hmm. to try to bring people to 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 close the divides that are artificially exploited all too often for short-term advantage or profit. Let me ask you a quick question while, while I have you, and that is, what do you think uh, President Ford would think about Grand Rapids in 2024? Well, he would think it was, you know, his, his agents used to tell the last visits, because he'd come back a lot. And um, I think he became more nostalgic rather than less. And he used to, uh, the, the agents would drive him around town to the old neighborhood. And you know, that's where Betty and I lived. And so, by the way, <laughs> wonderful thing. When, when they were courting, they concluded that among the things they had in common, they were both members of the Urban League. Mm -hmm. And they, they courted at meetings of the Urban League. <laughs> that's probably the only president who could, who could make that statement. <laughs> he would be, on a level, proud. This building, there was no um, guarantee that this building would be here. He gave his papers to the university, and the university wanted the whole deal. But Ford, you know, the, once a congressman, always a congressman, he split the baby, and he gave the papers <laughs> to the academic institution, and he took the museum that could be a tourist attraction and an economic asset. And why is it here? Fred Meyer offered him the land with Meyer Gardens there uh, to be found today. And he thanked him, but he really wanted to put it downtown. And the fact is, people forget, this building opened the same day that the Grand, uh, the old Pantland, the renovated Pantland Hotel opened. And, and together, they were a spark. They told investors, they told all those people who were afraid to come downtown, physically and financially, that, hey, guess what? There's, there's a future here. And so on that level, he would be astonished and, and, and very proud. He would also, however, he was thoughtful enough and I think um, humane enough 
to, to grasp what I've said, that there's another whole Grand Rapids that um, um, isn't being addressed. There's a lot of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Can Thank you. Yep, I want to. Yep, yep, just a few minutes. Yep. Anything? I mean, again, you don't have to. I just want to give you give you all an yeah. opportunity. And I'd like to add that I think that now we feel like there's more common ground. Uh, it certainly has increased in diversity in our city, um, but I still think there's still a lot of subtle racism and discrimination that exists. And some of it could be myth and some of it's true. There's a lot of folks that move here. I work with a lot of people that move in from out of the area. And they they just don't feel welcomed. So we have all these things to offer. You read the media and it says we're like the most prominent wanted city to live in and zip code to live in. But yet folks don't feel welcomed. Thank you. Doretha and I are both on the board of uh, directors of a community land trust that is um, has been developed by Dwelling Place Nonprofit Housing Corporation of Grand Rapids. And we have been working on this. I started working with the former director of Dwelling Place probably in 2003. So it has taken me a while to see a community land trust really come to fruition. But we have been working at Dwelling Place, I would say, for probably five years, uh, you know, purchasing property at uh, in the Burton Eastern area, putting up 42 homes that are affordable to, um, to middle-class families who can qualify for a mortgage. And I believe they had a ribbon cutting last Wednesday. I was out of town, but there was ribbon cutting last Wednesday. So this is very, very contemporary. This is not history. But there were some very difficult, um, I would say, struggles within uh, the neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, people still, even though they... And, and I think people are sincere in this. They do believe in, in equal access to housing opportunity. They, they would not deny that. But when it happens in your neighborhood, hmm. people are still very, very much afraid. And, and these, you know, this is the sort of fear that is, since Richard has not pulled the plug on the internet, it is very easy to, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to promote that sort of fear and to make it a very, very strong force in people's lives. Um, people are afraid that property values are going down. They are afraid that somehow the families who move in, who are teachers, who are nurses, who are firefighters, I, I mean, they, they have a perception that the people who move in are going to be somehow unsafe in the neighborhood. And so, I mean, even people of goodwill, I think, still have a ways to go in really accepting the concept of equal access to opportunity in this town. And so I guess when you asked, Joe, about a vision, uh, my vision used to be kind of like Cheryl's. Which you, yes, <laughs> which you so beautifully described. And I would say that that has morphed over the years into um, a vision that, uh, that, that Grand Rapids is it's not supremely tolerant. It's it's about like other places, I think. It's it's a good community. It's a good place to have a family. It's a good place to grow up. But, but what I hope, uh, since I can't get that pie in the sky thing anymore, I hope that we still have organizations and churches and people who still have the courage to push forward even when there is the kind of pushback that, um, that, that there just always will be, I think, uh, about new, new neighbors, new opportunities for new neighbors. And so I, I think that it's always gonna be a push, but I think there's always gonna be people there. Thank you. Thank you very much.
like to turn to the audience and open things up for questions. Anyone who may have a question and uh, give our panelists an opportunity to respond. Yes, sir. Um, a couple of my family members, and we even had an apartment in complexes that are owned by uh, private equity firms out of state where everything's by digital online, you put in a maintenance request, you don't talk to anybody, you may have somebody minimum wage in an office a few hours a week, but those rents have been going up and up, and I know politically there's a lot of difference of opinion on what rent control, we have a couple landlords at least here who go below market rate, and we have not run anybody who's interested in going below market rate for my family members, and I just, and I understand, I'm not, I'm not a finance guy, but there are people with enough money they can now buy individual homes and convert them to rental property and again charge well above market rate. And, and they could break the, if it is a comfortable black community or neighborhoods you have now. My daughter lives down, town is in the Merton area and likes her house and her neighbor's fine. But there are people that can afford to buy a lot of homes and convert them to rental property and make them unaffordable. So I just, is there a, a balance there that can be uh, it's still a fair fair market but but takes into consideration what people can pay over time i think, I think that's a, re a really good question i'd probably turn to uh either lee or or Doretha to respond to that based on your background but also you just mentioned the the, uh, the community land trust and it just seems again the gentleman is speaking of something that we're all hearing and seeing more of just your thoughts on uh, what could be the answer to that? It's um, it, it's really a difficult situation for new homeowners. I yeah. I mean I I bring up um, I mentioned our purchase in 1978 really to illustrate how easy it used to be compared to how hard it is today. And there is um, there there is not much law against the kind of profit that is being taken out of a very commercialized housing market right now. And that is uh, that presents a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. Doesn't really have much to do with fair housing law, which prohibits discrimination on a variety of characteristics that don't have much to do with, uh, with, with income or with wealth. But I do think that, um, that I would give Kent County and particularly Grand Rapids a lot of credit in the ways that they are trying to address that whole affordability crisis. I mean, the, the community land trust is, um, is one way. I mean, I think of the work that has gone into it and it only represents 42 homes, but those 42 homes are, are a big step into the future. Uh, there is more housing being built and so that right there, I think, affects uh, the law of supply and demand, which works very much right now in favor of uh, sellers and in favor of landlords. But I think that um, I, I think that an awful lot of people. I have a landlord in my family, and and uh, who has really the same um, approach that that Beverly has. Um, a lot of people are going to have to depend on those private landlords, and I think the fact that uh, that private equity firms are purchasing so much property and that property is still kind of a bargain in Grand Rapids is a factor that that really should be dealt with sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just just, just for uh, for for those who are into uh, facts and figures, according to Zillow.com, the average Grand Rapids home value um, in 2024 is. A two hundred eighty-six thousand dollars, and so when I hear about that bargain basement price that you paid for your five-bedroom home in East Grand Rapids, that was, a, that, was, that, was that was a lot of money, though. I guess in that day, correct? You're right about that. You're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But my goodness, Man, anybody want to buy a home in East Grand Rapids for fifty k? Anybody? Any takers? Any takers? Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Any other questions? Any other questions for our panelists? Yes. Um, all right, so I live in the Elgin Heights area and saw a lot of those discussions with that development. And one of the major concerns, and something I haven't necessarily been brought up today, was parking, transportation. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an issue. And I, I think when you look at a family's household budget, you know, that primary amount is housing, the secondary, transportation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that they're just so inherently linked. Um, because as prices rise, there's a lot of people that are in poverty that, that need to rely on public transit. They're being pushed out of the city and they're getting further and further from those transportation resources. 
And um, and if they can, if, if people can use public transportation and rely on it, and there's good service, they can't afford a higher rent because you're only paying forty-five dollars a month compared to what you'd pay for gas and insurance and everything else that you need for car maintenance. So I'm just wondering, you know, in, in your work, what what has been done or what have you been seeing to help promote better transit? Um, or better transit-oriented development to include bus passes in rental packages, to include bike stations, to include things that would help support and cut budgets. <laughs> Looking at Lee. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, we have a transit system in Kent County that has not kept up with the housing market. And so the mo this is a private opinion. I won't. I can see uh, Liz Keegan from the Fair Housing Center wanting to make sure that nobody thinks this is coming from the Fair Housing Center. <laughs> <laughs> this is coming from the former director of the Fair Housing Center. <laughs> we we have as we increase the density of housing in Grand Rapids, which is I believe a good thing. More people can live here. We can build more housing. Uh, we have not increased the utility of the transit system. And the two have to go together. We, we can't ignore transit if you're going to have housing be more dense. And so I worked, I think, in probably in the 90s on the first transit millage that we had. We only have six communities in Kent County that participate in that millage. We need much more and much more effective public transit to go along with our housing market. Otherwise, the burden becomes too great on, on the housing market. And, you know, we have cars, we have parking. You can't always get there on the bus. It doesn't always run. You look at the amphitheater downtown. I don't believe they have a parking place reserved for me. You know, these, these are contemporary issues, and we have to, we have to address them in balance. The other thing that I think is, this is really an old idea, and probably nobody up here can remember it, but I used to work a lot with an organization here in town that was promoting walk-to-work programs. <laughs> so I happen to live kind of near Blodgett Hospital and the Clark Home uh, Board of Ed building. You know, wherever you have an institutional employer, if a, if a family can be encouraged to live by that large employer, one of uh, somebody can walk to work. I mean, the cost of having a car in in Michigan is probably now what eight nine thousand dollars a year in terms of insurance payments, uh, gas, all that sort of thing. If you can save that kind of money in transportation in a household, you frequently can make a bigger house payment and buy that house that you want and that puts your kids in a school district that is good for them. So. I mean, there are ways to address this, but we really have to be very, very proactive. I think everybody running for office locally ought to be asked about those, those kinds of things because these are local decisions. I mean, we can do this. This does not have to wait for Washington or Lansing or anybody. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dale. Joey, you may have to help get me there, so I'm not sure there's a question in here. <laughs> but, if, you know, thinking the introductions and even Tony pointing out all the things that were going on at the, you know, the time of the, the display back there going on in 1968, I mentioned the 14th Amendment. And, um, well, by the way, one of the things I did not mention in my list, the National Constitution Center is also a resource that uh, certainly we use at the museum. It's uh, great for schools, great for individuals, well-researched, to uh, get to any aspect of it. But the, the 14th Amendment, right, one of the three Civil War amendments that they're called. And as I listen, what keeps going through my head, the lawyer in me that really became enamored with that amendment, are two, really four words, due process, equal protection, right? And those two, and how long it took, right? It took court cases to overcome separate but equal. 
it took those court cases to be able to then say, allow Congress to pass civil rights, voting rights, equal protection, and then so they could be in due process and equal protection could be enforced in the states. So it's that those national issues, uh, principles that take a hundred years, right, to play out, and then how we and to see you all reacting here. You know, in, in real time. So the optimist and the realist, <laughs> and where we are and where we have to go. I, there, there's just something, and say I'm not sure what the question is, but something churning through over time that you're talking about from a place to now to the future. I don't know what it is, but there's something here, Reverend. Help me. <laughs> well. If I could, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it took more than legal cases. The fact of the matter is, it was the assassination of Dr. King in April of 1968 that made possible the passage of the Fair Housing Act. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably would not have happened, but for the enormous reaction, and quite frankly, uh, the violent reaction. That, that occurred in a great many cities, including Washington, D.C. Gerald Ford, I heard him tell me the story. Um, he, his office, this is very Grand Rapids, his office opened two hours earlier than anyone else's. <laughs> he got to work early. And he would walk over sleeping members of the National Guard who were being bivouacked in the Capitol uh, they were there to protect the Capitol and other, you know, buildings while, you know, there, there were fires raging three blocks from the White House. That had an impact. The, the optimist says, there's a wonderful book called Miracle at Philadelphia about the Constitutional Convention. And the real miracle is not what happened at Philadelphia. The miracle is that 55 white men who were even then unrepresentative of the country, wrote a document, flawed as it was, imperfect as it was, that was capable of being amended, revised, reinterpreted, expanded, often because people went into the streets and demanded it. And over time, the, the, the promises that had not been kept but were implicit in the founding documents of this country. Um, it took a long time for women to get the vote. It took a longer time for African Americans in the South to get the vote. But it happened. And the optimist says that because of people like these folks, and no doubt many of you uh, who care enough to be insurgents <laughs> when you have to, and who have a vision uh, and will stick to it, that, you know, you've, as an outsider, a former outsider, who's, uh, uh, as I say, a, a proud resident of Grand Rapids, I've seen this city change, not just physically, but spiritually. But I'm sure it's a long way from the vision. And the optimist says the history of America is over time, the promises get kept. But it's not easy, it's not fast, there's nothing foredained, and every single one of us have to rededicate ourselves to the process. Thank you, Richard. Okay. The realist is talking. <laughs> okay. To the young man in the red shirt in the front. <laughs> Not to you, but piggybacking on what you talked about. I would love to have a conversation with people in large groups, whatever small, about the gentrification of housing, of housing that is going on right now. 
that ownership, we all grew up with go to school, get a job, get a house, home ownership. It's not there. Mm. We're getting eat up if we don't start dealing with the housing issue in Grand Rapids. Oh, the press is here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. It is, yes. Is being taken over by corporations, which is furthering the divide and the opportunity for folks like you and I and your grandkids to own their own home. It's sneaking up on us. We are Grand Rapids nice. <laughs> and before you know it, it it's just, it, it, we got to wake up, people, and see what's coming down the pike. I want to close with this, if I can. I want to, um, I'll turn to uh, Cheryl and Beverly uh, and ask the question. Again, you all are sitting here and you're representing, um, you know, one of the big four uh, from Auburn Hills and your, and your dad, Dr. Julius Franks. Um, when you think about the sacrifice that was made uh, by your father and by the three others and the countless others whose names we haven't mentioned, who stepped out and again, stepped out with real courage to bring about change, would love to hear uh, in closing, um, you know, how this idea that you know, change takes on different forms, but it was the decision of these four gentlemen and their wives, I want to also include, obviously, to step out and to be a part of significant change. Uh, would, would just love to have you close us out uh, with um, your father's decision to engage in change. And whether we want to admit it or not, something that has totally, I mean, it's, it, it changed Grand Rapids. Your, your father, right? Your family, the Spencer, changed Grand Rapids. And I think for the, for the better, yes. well, we all played a part in that. Yes. As we grew up, we, we um, every generation wants the next generation to do better than they did. Huh. And it's happening. And that's what I think was most important, one of the things that was important for all four of the big four, was to, for us to have an opportunity to be equally evaluated on our merit at whatever level, whatever we were doing. Not to take advantage of it, but on our own merit. That we earn the right, as we're talking about housing, to own our own homes without discrimination, without paying extra, without going too far. That's why we still, to this day, need housing. We need the- um, Fair Housing Center. The Fair House, sorry. Yeah, I'm getting up there. <laughs> you know, when you get up there, you say what you want. <laughs> <laughs> We need folks like the Fair Housing Commission to help us stay on track. We need other entities within Grand Rapids, and they're slipping my mind right now. But we need folks to help, to be part, to have a voice. Not always the money, but we need your voice. We need your feet on the ground. We can't underestimate the neighborhood associations. They are a big part of helping things move along, transportation. We, yes, it all comes to money. So who owns, who has the money? Let's be real. Uh, I, didn't I tell you the corporate? You said it, the corporations, some of them, not everybody. Um, and, but we have good people on the ground who don't have a lot but give a lot. And we need more of those folks on the ground to help in this arena of housing in particular. Thank you. Thank you much. The optimist is speaking now. <laughs> and I think what really happened is if you look back at the four individuals that thought up this idea, social worker, professional, teacher, teacher. school system, 
What do they all have in common? Service. They wanted better for the people. I didn't say their people, the people. And they wanted to open doors for minorities as well as whites. There's still a White House, remember. <laughs> that they wanted to show them that they were just as worthy as everybody else. I think my sister puts it very succinctly as a realist of what we need on the ground. But they were people that had already been on the ground, the four of them. Yeah. They went to the next level. The ground was not enough for them. When they opened doors for my father to play football at the University of Michigan, that was a door that was opened after Willis. When they opened doors for Triplet to teach at the school, that was a door that was opened. When my sister opened the door to a family that didn't qualify, that was a door that was opened. That's what we as optimists <laughs> want and know that I think our parents wanted that for us. I just thought of something when you were, I was listening to everybody and they had this land. Now the land was already there, but we were talking about transportation and going to work and walking. That piece of property is so prime, there's busing on the street already, and they tried to block it because they didn't want us to have a pathway. I don't know if you've ever been over there, but you, can't get, you can only get in in one way and out one way. Right. There's no way to get through. They cut us all off. There's transportation over there. There's employment opportunities over there. There's access to downtown through them there. <laughs> and I don't know if they knew that already, but they sure had a heck of a plan that they opened those doors for all those 42 houses and families to be able to access. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking <laughs> Beverly Franks Grant, Cheryl Franks, Richard Norton Smith, Doretha Ardoin, and Lee Weber. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like your story. <laughs> I got to talk more. Wow, thanks so much for such interesting, perceptive comments. I've got to say, Cheryl, when you're talking about opening doors, one of the doors you've opened up for me tonight is the door of understanding. The door of understanding precedes so many other doors. You know, I'm looking at those two photographs there, two images, President and First Lady on that wall. One of them has a very thoughtful look, and the other is smiling. And I can't help but think that those are the two dominant reactions out here when you open that door of understanding, thoughtfulness and smiling at being able to understand. Uh, one thing I would say, since we're talking about the Constitution and all, I regard the preamble of the Constitution as the closest thing we Americans have to sort of civic commandments of what we should be doing. And what is the first of the civic commandments in the preamble? To form a more perfect union. And I can't help but think that all five of you panelists and Joe Jones, Reverend Jones, did a lot to help us in this audience and broadly in our community to help us form a more perfect union. Thank you for that. So really appreciate all of you for being here. I appreciate our wonderful partners. Gosh, Dale, it's just been great. This is our first official partnership. Let's do this again, brother, okay? <laughs> Let's do this with the Public Museum. I also want to thank, of course, our excellent partners, Season In and Season Out, you know, with, with Brooke and her team here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum and Library over in Ann Arbor. We love working with, with all the great partners in this community. Now, if you got something out of tonight, if you were challenged, if you think a little differently, maybe, there's a little tug in your mind and in your heart that makes you a little different tonight. These are the kinds of programs that we put on at the Ford. I hope you'll consider becoming a friend of Ford if you're not. And just to keep the good vibe going, we have, uh, this, this is the week, this is the week we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Gerald Ford becoming the 38th President of the United States on Friday, August 9th. 
We have program on August 8th, August 9th. It'll include Carla Hills, Secretary Hills, whom you saw at the beginning. It'll include Mike and Steve Ford. And it'll include uh, General Albert Zapanta, the first Latino ever who was confirmed by the Senate and served in the Ford cabinet. So we hope very much that you'll be able to come back to those events, go online and check out all the programs. But thank you all for, for being engaged, for being here. Have a great evening.